Hello and welcome to the Festival of Tomorrow. I'm Ali from Aurot Digital and I'm here with Ira Wave the streamer and Paul Smith from the UK Space Agency. Um, we're here playing Mars Horizon, which is a video game that you can play on PC, Xbox One, PlayStation and Nintendo Switch, where you lead a major space agency as you guide humanity to Mars in a strategy simulation game. Construct a base, design and build rockets, conduct missions throughout the solar system and write your own history of space exploration. Created with support from the European Space Agency. And now I'm going to let Ira and Paul introduce themselves. So Paul, if you'd like to go first. Hi everyone, I'm Paul Smith. I work for the UK Space Agency as Robotic Exploration Program Manager. And Ira? Hi, I'm Ira. I'm a Twitch streamer and a graphic designer and a big fan of space and space games. Cool, and Ira is currently um, playing Mars Horizon, but on a campaign that they've started a while ago. So Ira, do you want to let us know where you are, who you're playing as, and um, what your favourite bit about the game is? Yep, so um, I'm playing as the European Space Agency, um, and I've gone like quite a way into the game. As you can see, we're now exploring the other planets in the solar system. We're about to do a mission on Venus and a mission on Mars. Um, and yeah, my favourite thing about Mars Horizon is how like accessible and straightforward it is and how like that makes it exciting for everyone to play <laughs> so we've got two missions going at the moment i think oh we've got three missions so one is a solar observatory one is the mars flyby mission which i think we've done the first phase for um we're about to do the second phase and then we are in planning to do the venus impactor mission we're just building this is this is this a rocket i think <laughs> 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 it looks like a rocket. <laughs> We're building that and um, yeah, so that part for the Venus Impactor finishes in seven months. Oh, okay, we're launching. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the Solar Observatory. Um, so a research group is looking to set up an orbiting solar observatory, launch a satellite into Earth orbit to take part in the project. So I think this is a joint project um, with some other space agencies, maybe. Oh, good that we get to start the stream off with a rocket potentially exploding. <laughs> no, it will be fine. There'll be no exploding rockets today. None. Well, you said I can't reload my save if I do anything wrong. So. No, you cannot reload your save. This is not a video game anymore, this is real life, so... <laughs> so, 84% launch reliability. I think, I think we're good to go. Yeah? Reckon That's we're good to go. Reckon we can nail this. I think it'll be fine. Yep. <laughs> I do feel like it's always the, like, 99% ones that explode, though. <laughs> I feel like it's a beautiful day for a rocket to explode. <laughs> looking good so far yay yay <laughs> i'm so glad oh very about... close <laughs> yeah. yeah a bit too close it's fine no one knows it was only 90 percent, 19 percent. so paul when do you relax during a real life launch is it like just after it leaves the atmosphere or that because that's when we celebrate obviously <laughs> But like, when is it? When do you celebrate it? Well, launches are well, as you know, very complicated. And so, as soon as it leaves the atmosphere, you can get a bit of breathing space. But um, from there, you've got you know, being able to release the satellite, um, you know, separate the spacecraft, and all of these other things happen. You know, you've got a um, second stage of a rocket has to um, you know, send the spacecraft into orbit as well so that's you know you're igniting another engine but this time it's not on earth so it's a little safer but you know, there's still plenty of um things that can go wrong uh you know, luckily though you have a lot more time to work through things once everything is up in space if there are issues you can um hopefully do some things about it from the ground. Uh, but you know, speaking to scientists and engineers who work on these things, they don't relax. <laughs> it's always fingers crossed, hope for the best. Especially with things like um, landers, when you send things to another planet, land on them, you've, you've got that initial launch 
anxiety. And then this long period of waiting until the spacecraft gets there. And then what's called you know, the seven minutes of hell, the landing on Mars, where you basically have no communications and you can't do anything with the with the spacecraft as it enters the atmosphere. So very much just wait and see and hope for the best. Oh my goodness. Yes, I was um, able to watch the the NASA InSight lander um, on, land on Mars at Oxford University and all of the scientists there were, yeah, rack, nerves were racked and uh, cheers and tears were had when the first images came back from the surface. It can be a very emotional moment for people who worked almost their entire careers on, on these things. Yeah, can you imagine? Yeah. Does it happen very often that if something goes wrong, like, because in here, obviously the rockets blow up, in real life, is it like a case that something might go wrong and the whole thing is destroyed? Like, does that ever happen? It does happen. Um, Mars in particular is, is hard to get to. Um, something like only 50% of all missions to Mars actually succeed. And that's including you know, um, orbiters that are then landing on it. It's, it's space is hard. It's very difficult to get there successfully. Most of the um, the sort of errors that happen, um, you can solve before a launch happens. So you can, you know, if the weather looks too bad, you can cancel the launch. Uh, if there's you know something wrong with the fuel lines or something, you can you can um, cancel the launch before anything goes wrong. But once it's in space, you're kind of tied to it. So, um, why are us humans so focused on getting to Mars? Uh, Mars is it's our close neighbour. It's pretty similar to, to Earth in many respects, but it is you know, half, half the size of Earth. It has about a third of the gravity. Um, it has a very thin atmosphere, but we think that it used to be a lot more Earth-like. So. We used to have liquid water on the surface. And as we know, everywhere there's water on Earth, there is life. So Mars is a prime candidate for finding life or the evidence of past life that originated separate from the Earth. And so it's, it's, it holds a lot of promise for answering questions about you know, the origins of, of life as we know it. That's really fascinating. What do you think makes it able for Mars able to have water and stuff where the other planets can't? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Mars inhabits an area that's sort of called the habitable zone around our star. Uh, so it's it's close enough that um, when it did have an atmosphere, uh, there would have been liquid water on the surface. But if you go too far um, away from the sun, then no liquid water can exist. It's only ice. Or if there is liquid water, it's in case under you know, miles upon miles of ice. There's um, moons of Saturn and Jupiter um, have a couple of liquid oceans that are encased in kilometers of ice. If you get too close to the sun, then all of the water boils away. So you know, there, there's this sweet spot where you know, we exist where you know, we're in perfect climate you know, with liquid water, bright levels of oxygen and so on. Um, and Mars is just sort of on the edge, basically. And so it, it's, if it had still had a big atmosphere, then you know, there would be a chance of even living on Mars. You know, it's, that's, that's the other part of the, why it's so um, prevalent in sort of human exploration is you know, we, we all have dreams of living and working on other planets and Mars is you know, the closest one that isn't actively hostile to us say like Venus which is you know, but away greenhouse effects um, oh yeah <laughs> and sulfur volcanoes it's not a very nice place to live <laughs> yeah <laughs> Doesn't sound like it, no. 
Um, so I'm just about to start the next phase of the Mars flyby mission. Um, so that's uh, sending a probe um, up to go and look at Mars, um, which is really cool. There, there it goes. <laughs> Off on a big adventure to look, have a look at Mars. <laughs> so I guess like in Mars Horizon, the first phase of this is like when the um, when the probe and the rocket leaves Earth, and then this is it arriving at Mars. So of course there's like tasks you have to do at each side to make sure it leaves safely and make sure it arrives safely. Is that like um, quite an accurate representation of in real life? Like, do you just kind of like forget about it until it gets to where it is? <laughs> yeah. Well, on on the way to somewhere like Mars, um, you'll be in contact with the with the spacecraft itself. It will probably be um, in a low power state because its engines aren't active, you know, it's not generating enough electricity so on to keep itself fully active. Plus there's not really a lot for it to look at on the way, but you'll be in com uh, communication with it. So you'll have like technical readouts and um, you'll know what, whether anything's going wrong, whether, you know, your comms equipment are working as they don't seem to be in this one. <laughs> <laughs> You noticed. <laughs> I was just going to be like, maybe I can fix this without anyone realizing. <laughs> I think it's going to be okay. It's, it's the the first round. Oh no! <laughs> it, in the game, it feels like really high stakes at this point because um, you spent so much time and so much money getting this thing just for it to like not not work <laughs> at the other end. <laughs> Oh my gosh, okay. It's gonna be okay, I have three turns left. We can fix this. <laughs> okay, if you think so. Yeah. This is, this like little mini game is my favorite part of the game actually. Is it? <laughs> I really enjoy like choosing the symbols and making the numbers add up and stuff. <laughs> it's it's really quite fun. satisfying, isn't it? When it yeah. Goes, especially when it goes right and doesn't go wrong. Not that it's gone yeah. horrifically wrong for you yet, but. It's okay. I've got two out of three things. I only need to get two more, two more of these. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm I think you can do it. Oh. I think you can do it. I'm sure I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> we're not. We're not going for the fifty percent bonus this time. It seems a bit too risky. Yes, I agree. <laughs> uh, so, Paul, do you enjoy games in general? Yeah, I do. I my off time. I like to play, play a few games. Um, base games are obviously uh, part of that. He doesn't enjoy space. You know, for the reason I'm in the career that I am. But yeah. Um, I tend to play uh, strategy games more, um, but I have a, a big soft spot for things like Mass Effect. You know, that was a um, big space franchise. Um, my my favorite game series of all time though is Homeworld. Uh, not the Homeworld series. Um, nice. um, so how did you get into the space industry? So my degree is actually in um, psychology and neuroscience, uh, and from there I uh, went to work for what is now um, UK Research and Innovation, which is the uh, sort of funding agency for science in the UK, and. It turned out that the space agency was located in the same building. So I eventually badgered a bunch of people, knocked down the door and uh, you know, work, worked my way in through um, applying for everything. And <laughs> I, I was lucky enough to get um, yeah, one of one of the roles with a big mouthful of a title. Um, but it is mm -hmm. my you know, it's, it's a dream role, really. And you get to um, speak to scientists and engineers and look at rovers and help you know, fund and design new technologies for space exploration and talk regularly with you know, NASA and ESA and one of the other space agencies. So it's much like doing um, you know, combined missions on, on Mars Horizon as well. So it's 
It's um, fun to see my job as a game. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, what was it that made you decide that you wanted to um, work at a space agency? Uh, well, space is you know one of those things that every kid dreams of. And I grew up on on science fiction, um, watching Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica and all of that um, sort of thing. So, you know, who doesn't want to be an astronaut and step on the moon or Mars? So, um, now I get to, yeah, um, send rovers to Mars and speak with astronauts on a you know, almost daily basis. You know, it's it's. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Um, so we completed the um, the Mars flyby mission. Unfortunately, we were only the second agency to do that. Um, so would you normally I... restart now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure who got there first. Oh, OK. China got there first. That's fine. I'll just uh, sabotage this mission we're working on together. <laughs> In Mars Horizon, it feels like it's like almost it almost encourages you to be a bit antagonistic with the other agencies. Um, but I did accept a mission to work with China, I think, um, where we're going to look at the Earth's oceans with a satellite. Is this like a common kind of mission you'd work with other space agencies on? Like how how does it look when you're co cooperating with other agencies? That's it's a really good question. Um, so a lot of what we do in the UKSA is part of ESA, um, which is the European Space Agency, and is um, the combined total of 21 countries, not only in Europe, but also um, including Canada as well. And so we all collaborate together uh, within ESA, but ESA also collaborates with uh, agencies like NASA, uh, or Roscosmos, uh, the Russian Space Agency. The, there's a couple of, of big missions that we're collaborating on and providing instruments for as well. So ESA and NASA are working together on Mars sample return, uh, of which the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover that lands on the 18th of February on Mars is the first step for, and that will be caching samples of Martian soil that uh, a European rover and rocket system will eventually bring back to Earth. We're also collaborating with uh, Roscosmos on Luna 27, which is a, um, a robotic mission to the surface of the moon uh, that will you know, use British instruments to help um, analyze the lunar regolith or soil uh, of the moon and determine you know, whether there's uh, things like water or metals in the in the regolith that we can eventually use as they fuel the further rockets you know, to launch from the moon. That's really interesting. So I just had like a message come up about the public's response, the media's response to our Mars flyby mission. Apparently they were very disappointed that we didn't find aliens. Um, <laughs> and I had the option to either fund a campaign to um, reignite public support in <laughs> my space agency or commit to sending another like probe to Mars. Obviously in Mars Horizons there are a lot of situations where you can basically, like especially at the start, you can basically like tell the press that aliens exist and things like that. Like, <laughs> do you know like how much goes into like the PR decisions made by the UK Space Agency and um, ESA? You know, our, our communications team have uh, um, an enviable job of um, dispelling rumours about space aliens. Um, you know, they, they are very good at, at well, communicating with the wider public. You know, we have Twitter and, and we make regular announcements from our website. ESA you know, is, is a much bigger organisation and so has much more um, resources to engage with the public, you know, astronauts are all, as part of their contracts, they have to um, go and talk to 
with the press and to do talks with schools and education. Um, Tim Peake here, our own astronaut, has done a lot of, uh, of work with the public, with schools. And we've had very successful education campaigns with him. And so it's, PR is a big part of space. And whilst you, know, you sort of think, ah, spacey, that's always, you know, everyone's interested. You know, it's, it's not always the case that everyone automatically approves of everything that you did. It's all about education is sort of our primary thing. We would um, have fund projects in schools and at museums and things like that for you know, educating kids on, on space and engineering and STEM subjects. They're all interrelated and they're all um, really important for the future. Yeah, that's really cool. Um... Yeah, obviously, as someone who who really, really likes space and like loves like hearing about anything to do with space, it it kind of like surprises me to think that some people are maybe not as interested or like don't understand as well, like how like how cool it is that we send like machines up into space all the time and like we're learning new things about stuff that we can't even like see with our own eyes. It's really fascinating. The space industry is you know, one of those that provides a lot of hidden benefits. A lot of mobile phone technology all comes from space. Without, um, without satellites in space, you wouldn't have Google Maps or anything like that. Um, a lot of telecommunications, uh, satellite TV, the internet, are all enabled by space. Um, yeah, of course. Actually, I me meant to mention earlier, I had a um, pop-up come up saying that one of our satellites um, detected a hurricane before it hit, and um, which is really cool when you think about it. Like um, those other benefits you were talking about, and how like developing this technology is so important to like life on Earth as well. That's really fascinating. Yeah, you can use satellites for disaster relief, for you know, identifying the worst hit areas where lives need to go. There's early warning systems, you say, like hurricanes or um, tsunamis, things like that. Yeah, they're all um, extreme weather events and will be you know, mitigated by technologies in space and more climate science and imaging satellites and, and things like that that we have, the better um, we can respond to these kinds of you know, disasters. That's really interesting. I've just noticed that it turns out both um, both Russia, I think, and Japan are at Venus already. So I think I've officially lost the space race. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hang on, who's over there? Um, yeah, I haven't even like built the rocket to go to Venus yet, so it's fine. We're gonna get there. It's not. It's not the who gets there first. Everyone has their own path, right? <laughs> Sure. That might be very different from what I was saying at the start of the stream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, this is my Venus rocket that I'm just preparing for mm. a launch day. I mean, it's, okay. it's the taking part that counts, right? So, yeah, yeah. you definitely took part. <laughs> you definitely took part. <laughs> I, have, I have a rocket in it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Look at all of these. Maybe we're not launching it in like the next year, but <laughs> look it up there. Um, yeah, so these uh, these launch windows, the orange ones are suboptimal, and the red ones are like you can't launch during this date. So I have to either take a risk or launch it in like a full year. Yeah, it's now June, and my first optimal window is next August. So, what's your what's your launch reliability on the next one? Um, Seventy-three. That's not bad, I guess. I guess I could take a risk, and then if we show up and it's raining, we can reschedule. <laughs> okay. okay. The rain always throws me off. Yeah. It throws me off. I feel like at the start of the game, it's not like you feel like you can blow up every rocket and it's fine. But at this point, I'm like, <laughs> money is so scarce. <laughs> I cannot afford to blow up a, like several hundred thousand with a rocket, you know? <laughs> Fingers crossed. I've also... So I've had some new buildings. 
in here that I needed to build for a while and I've just not had the money. But I think now we can build this um this hall of fame. That will only leave you with like eighty one thousand though. Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> don't let me influence your decisions. It's a museum. Yeah. I oh know. no wait. It's well, increase the number of astronauts in the astronaut pool by four. Oh, I see. So this is like to help us recruit people. Yeah. It's like you can be famous and you can be in this building. Mm-hmm. One day. <laughs> but you have mm -hmm. to be an astronaut first. I really like this bit of the game as well. Like, it's really fun trying to figure out where's the best place to put it. Um, I love although, how like, chaotic everything's laid out on your face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I take it very seriously. I'm like, I gotta have as many like little plus signs as possible. We've got to keep things running smoothly. Actually, I don't think I can afford to put it down because I need to put it here, and I don't have the money to get rid of these rocks. That's okay. really sad. <laughs> oh, I mean, well. I think, that, I think that's a blessing in disguise, really. Um... Well, I don't. I was gonna say I don't need the money for anything else, but what if I blow up? Exactly. What if it blows out? Just saying. It's, it's gonna be more. okay. <laughs> right, we're gonna gonna launch maybe it's very the scary. Venus Impactor. <laughs> it's very <laughs> scary. It's not raining. Hooray! Oh, it's a lovely day. <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, nice pretty sunset or sunrise. I reckon you could nail this. Nice. Yeah, okay. let's go. Let's go. Maybe we could be third to Venus. Fourth, it'll be fourth. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Everyone else has already got there. Two people have got there. Three I people thought. have got there. I'm pretty sure oh I just God. said that the bronze badge has been taken. I might have misread that though, but I'm pretty sure the bronze badge has been taken. Well, I'm gonna be America no though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At least I'm not last. Oh no. <laughs> this is fine. It, it's gonna be fine. It didn't explode. Exactly. It didn't explode. It might like drift off into space, but uh, it didn't explode. God, you can do it. You can do it. Have faith. Um... A bit of faith. <laughs> <laughs> Crikey. Um. So, is it better to send robots to Mars instead of people, or? Certainly, in the first case, mm. you need um, you need to know what the environment is like, uh, unless you don't get there. As, uh... mm -hmm. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's going really well. You're just hoping that we're not noticing, aren't you? <laughs> I'm just like I'll just quietly, just quietly go with it. <laughs> Yeah, robots are, are a really important part of space exploration. They are much cheaper to send than people. You know, a, um, a human rated vehicle to the moon is considerably more expensive than just sending a small lander. Um, because you've got to be able to look after your astronauts. And you don't want anything bad to happen to them. Whereas it's less bad if something were to happen to a, a rover or a lander. Um, yeah, that's part of the reason we're sending the um, Rosalind Franklin rover, which was built here in Britain for the European Space Agency. Um, yeah, that's, that's a project that I've been lucky enough to be involved with and seen inside you know, the, the clean lab where it was built and assembled, which is you know, really exciting. Um, but you know, there, there's a reason we're sending it, and that's to A, you know, find past or present evidence of life on Mars, but also to pave the way for future human exploration of the Martian surface. It's really important to, to know what you're getting into before sending somewhere. You, know, you, you can't um, completely change all of your uh, 
mission parameters once you know, you've launched humans. You've got to have everything planned in advance. Otherwise, you know, you're just not going to be able to take advantage of the amazing opportunity that you have. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, um, how far off do you think we are from humans being able to go to Mars? Like, what's necessary for us to get there? Uh, Mars is, aside from you know it being far away and, and so on, it's it's the the journey to Mars is something that it's it's a long time. It's it's several months of astronauts being cooped up in a place that they can't get home from. And so you have a good, a really good um, space station environment, the ISS. But, astronauts can use as you know, that we're using as a way of um testing isolation or that sort of thing on humans but you've got to um have things like radiation protection because mars is so far away and um, the spaceship is is not protected from sun's harsh radiation as it is in orbit around earth so you've got to think about that. Um, it's there's large amounts of technology that we still don't that isn't fully developed enough to land people on Mars. Plus, the fuel requirements are, are so large that it may become prohibitively expensive to build a, a single rocket to go there, land, and come back. So you've got to have multi-stage vehicles and possibly even um, fuel production on the surface of Mars that heads there beforehand to generate enough fuel for the astronauts to come home again. And so there's there's a lot of technology that we need to work out beforehand. Um, and after um, NASA's Artemis project, which is the, um, you know, the next man and the first woman back on the moon, uh, They'll be looking further, further afield, and Mars may well be you know, everyone's next target. So, you know, that's part of why the Artemis project exists, is as a stepping stone on the way to human exploration of Mars. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's so much to think about. It's like such a such a big, big mission. Yeah, hundreds, thousands of people are involved and. Um, Thinking about it all day, every day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we did the first phase of the Venus Impactor. I told you I had it all and could under control. <laughs> well done. Everything went Never very well. <laughs> <laughs> we are on our way to Venus. Um... <laughs> I'm so proud. I I honestly didn't expect it to go as well as it did. So. Congrats. What can I say? I am I am a pro at running the ESA. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be vying for my job next. <laughs> oh, look at all those optimal launch windows. Right. Nice. Why can I have that before? <laughs> um. See, now I have a choice because I've got like. Um, actually, I might start some different training because um, you can set training to improve, like um, eat whatever your um, mission rewards you, or you can improve like launch reliability and stuff. And obviously, you get more benefit from the training the later you leave it. Um, so, because I have all these choice windows, I'm gonna leave it a couple of months and get like maximum research points so I can get to Mars quicker. <laughs> nice. Nice. Tactics. I like it. I like it. Yep. <laughs> you don't be the first person, the fourth person to Venus. <laughs> 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 oh, this is a, this one is going to the moon. So send a probe to orbit the moon and photograph its far side, the hemisphere facing away from Earth. Oh, it has minus 10% launch reliability, so I'll probably do some launch reliability training. Okay. Wait. There we go. 
Um, and that can wait a few months as well because it's not like it's not like going to Venus for the first time, which we needed to do like right now. <laughs> I think we're about to start the next phase of the Venus mission. Oh, cool. Um, oh, we have loads of money now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait. Let me see. 750 to remove this rock. <laughs> It's quite steep. 750,000, my bad. <laughs> and then there's 500 to build. I don't have enough to do this. Oh no. Well, you gotta get rid of the rock at one point, right? I do. I do have to get rid of the rock, yeah. It might be like... Oh no, I have two rocks to get rid of. This isn't working out. As well as I'd hoped. <laughs> I have to say, like, removing rocks is, like, my biggest obstacle in this game. <laughs> um, oh, I can put it here, and it'll only cost me 600,000. Okay. There you go. Yes! Well done. <laughs> um, okay. I don't have enough time to build the like, actual, actual useful, useful building, building. Um, which, which costs, costs a lot of money. Dear. Cool. Cool. I'm excited for this. This is going to go well. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> Nothing has gone wrong yet, which I'm surprised about. Nothing has gone wrong yet. I'm also surprised. Apart from the, me saying that I was winning the space race and I clearly wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have, like, you know, high goals, I think. Oh, this one's got heat on it. Cool. Oh, okay. Cool. These missions scare me. <laughs> So much. Oh, I see. Two heat will be generated at the start of the next spin. Oh, so I have a temperature dial I need to watch out for now. Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh, this is actually terrifying. <laughs> Sorry, no pressure. No pressure. Oh man, and some of the, some of these actions add heat as well. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So you just have to. Yeah. Okay. No, so they tu they turn heat they into the heat? things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That might be useful then. Yeah, see the temperature's gone down now. Okay, cool. We need to keep the temperature down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's that's the difficult bit. I not not that it's difficult. I think you'll nail it. So I'm just what? Gonna oh. <laughs> you jinxed me. Okay, I'm not gonna give you any advice. I'm gonna just shut up now. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, no. Um. Oh no. It's okay. <laughs> um. Oh wow, that goes up a lot. <laughs> it adds two at the end of every turn, so you have to bear in mind that, yeah. Wow, why did I decide to come to Venus? <laughs> <laughs> um, to win the space race. Remember? Come fourth in the space race. <laughs> yes, to come fourth in the space race. You get a participant a participant's badge. Like, thanks for participating. You tried. <laughs> 99% on that one. <laughs> well done. That was good. That was a good one. You did that one well. <laughs> this mission is cursed. <laughs> oh dear. No, it's fine. As long as I have enough, like, lightning bolt things to keep resisting. Oh no. <laughs> This is scary. <laughs> oh no, this is scary. It's really scary. <laughs> I'm really nervous. I feel like I'm just like hanging on. The thing is like, if you don't get the objectives, you still like lose the whole thing, even if you don't. Oh no. It's okay. It's fine, you can resist it, it's cool. Yep. Okay. Okay. <gasps> <laughs> oh 
<laughs> Whoops. <laughs> okay. Um, let's get that temperature down. Yeah. I used to do both of these and also this, I think. Yeah, that should be fine. I mean, you've got no powers to resist anything. <laughs> It'll be okay. <laughs> we just have to pray that none of these fail, and then we've done it. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Why did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, really not enjoying you today, is it? It just doesn't want you no. to do. They were like, you thought you could be fourth, but actually you can't. Oh wait, you did it! <laughs> Despite everything. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, man. That was so oh, tense. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that is incredibly tense. <laughs> that was nail biting, that was. It's horrible. Don't do that to us again, Ira. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> do my best. Maybe I shouldn't have launched it in a several optimal <laughs> launch window. It's all about learning, isn't it? It's all about learning. Um, okay. Ah, oh, so we can take on. I don't think I've done this yet, actually. Go on. So multi crew orbit. Yeah, send some people up to space. Yeah. Safe. <laughs> I haven't had any trouble launching launching anything this time. It's just been when it's up there. But mm -hmm. it's gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know if I have enough astronauts actually. How many do you need for that mission? Um I don't know if you can find out yet. Maybe you have to build a place of payload first. I have two astronauts anyway. They're just like saying they have nothing to do, so they'll be excited. <laughs> just been sat there for years. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> okay. Well, they're getting paid. That's true. <laughs> they'll be doing training. <laughs> so, Paul, what do you think are the like biggest challenges in space exploration in general? Like, obviously, Ira's having a lot of trouble with her mini challenges. <laughs> um, what kind of what 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 are the real life <laughs> big challenges? Um, technology is one of the big ones. There's because there's it's relatively simple, sort of, for us to get to space the low Earth orbit now, to where satellites are and where the International Space Station is. But beyond that, there's a whole host of other issues. Um, we went to the moon in last in the in the 70s, right? And we haven't really been back since. So yeah, there's there's a lot of difficulty in getting even that far, let alone um, to Mars or Venus, as we've seen. Um, but Venus is Venus and Mars are two of our closest neighbors. Um, so you, know, you, you want to visit them, but the radiation environment near them is you know, so harsh that you need a lot of shielding and that adds more mass to a um, spacecraft, which means that it needs more fuel to lift, which means it needs a bigger rocket, which means you need more money and more technology to build a bigger rocket and so on so there's every little thing adds up and so if you want to send a human you've got to add their life support systems you've got to have food for them water to drink radiation shielding um, space for them to sleep to eat you've got to add a toilet you know, you know all of those things to think about as well um, as well as you know the psychological effects of leaving Earth for years at a time. So um, basically everything. That's that's what the biggest problems are. All of it. <laughs> yep. 
It sure seems like that when I'm playing Mouse Horizon. <laughs> it really is like managing so many things. Like, I have no money now. I haven't researched enough. My rockets exploded and I have to build another one. <laughs> and that, that's why every space mission is so important and you know, it's, it's so special. There's so many hundreds and thousands of people working on all of these things. You know, some of the smartest people on the planet um, who are working on these things. So, yeah, I have confidence that we'll get there. It's just a matter of time. So, um, as as Ira mentioned about rockets exploding, we haven't actually had any rockets exploding yet. yet. No, I actually <laughs> just had a very good launch. <laughs> I did see that. I did see that. I was very proud of you. It looked like it went well. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's because it's not trying to go to like any other planets. It's just going to a little bit. We've done that so many times. <laughs> Um, so we we spoke about this a bit briefly, but um, so what ap what actually happens in real life when a rocket explodes? So what processes are there, and are there like backup rockets to send, or do you spend all your time working on the one and then just hope that it, you know, launches successfully? Well, a, a rocket exploding is is a big event in the space industry. You've got to have a lot of investigation. There's got to be some um, independent reports on what happened. Um, if it's if people are involved, um, the two shuttle disasters both prompted um, shutdowns of the space shuttle fleet from NASA because you have to go back and check everything, recheck it, refurbish things, make sure that all of the problems are resolved because you, know, you you can't risk doing it again. Um, you know, Ten years ago, I'd have said, no, there are no backup rockets, but now um, SpaceX are using reusable rockets and have a whole fleet sat in their garages, basically. Yeah. Um, but even then, the spacecraft that you're sending up there, you know, your satellites or um, landers and so on, often don't have fully functional spares sat waiting just in case. Um, so companies will pay for insurance for their satellites. So if it does go wrong, they at least have you know, some money to try and rebuild, for instance. Um, but because of the inherent danger of launching in space, most spacecraft will have what's called a flight spare. That's um, you know, where you build each spacecraft twice, essentially. Um, one that's the flight actual flight hardware that will go into space. That's where you put most of your effort and time and money on. But you have a um, the spare in the background for like testing, um, you know, trying new solutions to things if something doesn't work out. You know, you'll you'll have um, that kind of semi-ready backup. That hopefully, if you know, fingers crossed, if something does go wrong, um, you can you do have something in your back pocket to to use just in case. Turns out I don't have enough money to launch another rocket for a while. <laughs> um, let's see how my haul of things is coming on. I was going to say, <laughs> how did you put that down? You spent so much money on rocks. <laughs> yeah. I did spend a lot of money on destroying rocks. <laughs> that might have been an issue. But it's okay, our haul of fame will be done in five months. So. Five months? Right, okay. Yeah. Okay, so we now have to just wait for the funding to come in. Yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so there are obviously lots of fictional versions of space exploration. So which ones are more accurate and which ones aren't? So like thinking of The Martian or Kim Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars trilogy, First Man, etc. Which ones are more realistic? Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars trilogy is one that's been held up for a long time as a as a good example of um hard sci-fi. So science fiction that is. You know, relatively accurate and but because it was written so long ago there's a lot of stuff that maybe we've now debunked or um are no longer relevant as technology has advanced and science has advanced um the martian was fairly accurate although um dust storms on mars are nowhere near as severe as at the start of the martian um you know they whilst they do engulf the planet, they're in 
the atmosphere is so thin that the dust itself is has to be very small and very light in order to be carried by the very, very faint breezes that exist because the atmosphere is so thin. So it's it's definitely not like standing in a storm in on Earth. Yeah. Um, but you know, science fiction doesn't have to always be entirely accurate. It's, yeah, it's about entertainment as well. And mm. if if your, um, your entire book is about you know, people astronauts sat twiddling their thumbs on the way to Mars, then it's <laughs> exciting. That's very true. It's very true. Although I should point out that they wouldn't be twiddling their thumbs; they'd be doing lots of valuable science. <laughs> So what's going on now, Ira? We're just waiting for money. I got some money, so I'm building. I'm building the rocket. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Gonna have another rocket finish in a bit. Oh yeah, this is the one for the multi-crew orbit mission. Oh yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how this one goes. <laughs> I have every faith it will go well. I'm sure. I mean, I've hired only the cheapest astronauts. So. <laughs> I really like building rockets that look like they shouldn't fly. Yeah, there's some weird combinations you can make. Yeah, like tiny little tops and then really, really big Oh, balls. wow, this one costs a lot of money. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess that one is on hold for a while as well. Oh, my God. That's a lot of money. Oh, my God. It is a lot of okay. money. It's going to take me a while to get there. <laughs> Just saving up to build my rockets. <laughs> Just put a penny in the jar every every now and then, and we'll get there. <laughs> sure, that's how they work out the funding. They're like, yeah. yep. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> a penny a day for the ESA. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think this is also going to be a really expensive... Oh my gosh, this one's so expensive as well. What have I done? Maybe you built a Hall of Fame instead of. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my rockets are too expensive. To be fair, this never happens to me because I always, I always start make my own custom agency and give myself loads of money to start off with, so I never, <laughs> never run out. It's one of the perks you can choose. You can choose a trait to have loads of money. I didn't I even know. One. I've just <laughs> been playing as a poor space agency this whole time. <laughs> I could have. <laughs> I mean, you say poor, but you're coming fourth in most of the events, so who's the real winner? If I gave myself loads of money, I probably wouldn't be fourth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so I don't actually need that extra part that I was putting on. That makes it a lot cheaper. I wonder if it's the same for this one. Okay. Wait. Is that more expensive than it was before? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, how much was it before? I think it might be. Yeah, that's that's very yeah, that's very expensive. But... I think it's just expensive because it has people in it. Like we don't want to cheap out on that. <laughs> yeah, well, that relates to what Paul's been saying about how much more goes into missions that I'm, I've got people on. Okay. Um, oh, the Hall of Fame finishes next month. Oh, okay. great! We can hire more astronauts. We can't afford to hire. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Goodness, goodness gracious me! We'll get we'll get some money from launching this rocket, maybe. Oh no, we'll probably just get silence. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just as valuable as money, if not more. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I have a question about the rovers, actually. Um, I'm really interested in how you drive them. Uh, is it like a video game, or how does it work? It's it's not quite a video game. Um, yeah, um, unfortunately, you can't have you know, your, your Xbox controller uh, <laughs> on Mars. Because there's, there's a half-hour delay oh. basically, between Earth and Mars. So... Um, any action that you take is you know, 30 minutes delayed on Mars. So if you hit a rock on Mars, you won't know about it until you know, half an hour later. You won't be able to react. So 
all of the movement of a rover is planned out in advance. Um, there we have um, scientists in the UK who helped NASA with the Curiosity rover, helped drive that. Um, you know, one of them told me that he, he uses his Microsoft HoloLens uh, to essentially drive it from his kitchen. Uh, you know, which is which is uh, an image. <laughs> um, you know, they scientists and geologists have to you know, work out what the terrain looks like, um, what it's likely to be, whether it's um, there's big rocks in the way, whether um, it's too steep for it to climb up, and so on. But um, the Rosalind Franklin rover will be um, it will have. A technology on it that allows it to make some of these decisions for itself and um, so it's never just sat waiting for commands it can adapt to some situations um you know, without human input which is you know, a big advancement if you don't have a lot of autonomous rovers on mars they're all so far they're all driven by um people here on earth um but the Rosalind Franklin rover also has a cool um, wheel system. Like it has six wheels, but they are also legs. So it can climb upstairs by moving each leg individually. It's uh, very slow, but it enables it to go further and, and in more difficult places than an ever before. I mean, it sounds cute, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I would get so attached to rovers. <laughs> I get so attached to them. I'm terrible uh, for things like that. <laughs> I think like it's also like part of it as well, isn't it? Like getting people to think the robots are really cool that are going to space, so they're interested in them. Yeah. Um, it's like, it is really like peak sci-fi though, like thinking about robots <laughs> going to other planets. Yeah, it is peak sci-fi. <laughs> Mars is the only world inhabited solely by robots. Oh yeah! That's such a cool way of putting it! <laughs> That's so cool. That's yeah, really cool. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> we had an okay launch. Okay. Oh no! Oh. I feel like, as soon as you're like, let's pay attention to what I was doing, <laughs> <laughs> this happens. It was going so well. Nothing bad had happened. I just want to say it. I'm just not going to say anything. <laughs> just i think you're making you're making the satellite nervous oh, right okay <laughs> <It's dry. laughs> so now i'm just watching in silence instead <laughs> yeah but for some reason it feels worse <laughs> oh my goodness oh man <laughs> right okay <laughs> I will simply not say another word. And we'll just That's watch fine. it in silence. It's fine. <laughs> there we go. That wasn't so bad. It was like, I'm going to shut up. Yay. <laughs> Concentration. Yeah. Yeah. Just weighing up if I can go for that 50% bonus or not. <laughs> uh oh. It's fine, though. It's fine. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to get there. Did you have you got any bonuses this this during this, this session? Yeah, I got the twenty five percent bonus for the first phase of this. Okay. <laughs> Usually I get them every time, but I don't know. Some, now some that you'll be like, watched. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'll be it. It's always the way. Um, but yeah, we're coming up to the end of our time now. Um, but thank you so much for both joining me. I've had a really nice time chatting about all things space with you both. Um, there's really interesting things from you as well, Paul, and I'm really sorry about your save, Ira. Um, <laughs> feel free to just restart when we're finished. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I think that's what I'll be doing. <laughs> I mean, you've made it to fourth on a few of those milestones, so... Yeah, you don't good. win the space race by accepting your mistakes. That's, <laughs> that's how it works. And thank you, everybody, for watching this at the Festival of Tomorrow. We hope you had a great time. And, uh, yeah, don't forget to check out Master Horizon on Xbox, PlayStation, PC, and Switch, um, which you can pick up on all of those. So, yeah, thank you so much for watching, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Oh, thanks. Bye.